Hello, everyone. My name is Joana Baix, and I am the IDF Vice President. And I would like to welcome you all to this interesting webinar on kids and the advocacy toolkit. I would like to thank all our speakers for their time to this webinar, and also uh, to Sanofi. Uh, I would like to thank Sanofi for their kind support. Without Sanofi support, nothing would be possible. First of all, uh, a few words about the youth activities at IDF. We have at IDF a working group focused on, on youth. We are working in, in several projects. One of those projects are kids, of course, which are relevant for us. But also uh, we are uh, having other projects such like the Young Leaders in Diabetes, which for us is highly relevant because we truly believe that um, youth is the future of diabetes and IDF, of course, but not only the future, the present of the diabetes worldwide. And we would like to, to uh, strengthen these projects uh, throughout the years because we truly believe that the, the youth projects, projects will make a difference in diabetes worldwide. Then I would like to introduce uh, Andrea and Inez that will share their experiences while living with diabetes uh, at school. Hello to everyone and thank you, Joao, for the introduction. As you already heard, my friend here is Andy. She is living in Mexico and she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in fifth grade of the elementary school on April 11th, 11 years ago. Today, 11 years later, she is an interior design uh, university student. Hello to all of you. Nice to meet you. And thank you, Ines. As you heard from Joao, my diabody here is Ines from Croatia. And she was diagnosed also in fifth grade on April 12th, but 16 years ago. Today, she is an architecture engineer and a graphic designer. And today we want to have a short chat with you about our background and how healthy school, schools are in Croatia and Mexico. And as the sugar in the end, we will discuss and share our ideas about what we can we, we think governments should do on that topic. So without further ado, let's begin. Andy, what were your challenges in school? Well, at the beginning of my diagnosis, I was really afraid of telling my friends and classmates about my diabetes. It was a top secret in my school and out of school too. Uh, just my teachers and a few friends knew about it. I must add that even if I was afraid of being rejected, fortunately, I never was or experienced stigma in school. But we have to acknowledge that many children with diabetes are and can often be discriminated against, right? Yes, indeed, in my experience, uh, was quite good. I was a shy person. Uh, I, was, I wasn't a shy person, so everybody knew that I have diabetes. It didn't matter to me when I was discriminated in school from one or two for, uh, school friends. Uh, you know how kids are. But what hit me very hard was when my teacher discriminated me in front of the whole class. So, yes, I had some difficulties with some teachers uh, who didn't understand diabetes, uh, especially the ones who had someone with diabetes type 2 and didn't want to understand the difference with, be, between the types. Lucky for me, I was ready for that and I managed to stand up for myself and uphold my rights. Nice. Yes, I can imagine being in that situation. Well, yes. Also, I knew a few friends or friend or kids that had the similar situation. And that period was very hard for them. At that time, usually kids will start to be shy and won't talk about diabetes anymore. Diabetes will start to be their top secret in front of the new friends and people they meet. Very hard topic. <laughs> Maybe it's better to move on. Uh, talking about the food in school, what would you say that school uh, canteens are healthy? Mm, not as much as we would like. In 2019, the Mexican Ministry of Health established a new labeling uh, on foods and beverages that have excess sugar, uh, calories, trans fats, saturated fats, and sodium in order to contribute to the prevention and control of non-communicable conditions. 
However, um, school cantinas, even knowing about the purpose of the new labels, they keep selling those products to kids and students and don't care about the future consequences they could have on their health. Does Croatia has done something to promote to promote healthy school canteens? Uh, I can say that uh, in Croatia, uh, vending machines are not allowed inside of the elementary school, but we can find them in some high school. In Croatia, that is for teens from 14 years old. And also there are national guidelines under the slogan healthy living, but unfortunately they're not implemented as they need. Uh, and also they're not so good for kids with diabetes or with a celiac condition. Uh, but because they are made from a lot of carbs, I mean, whole grain bread is better than uh, white bread and things like that. But still, there is a lot of carbs that our kids need to react. Yes, indeed. What do you think government should do about this really important topic? Uh, I think it would be the best to see why guidelines like these are not implemented for kids with diabetes, because it can lead to healthier kids and also prevent conditions such as diabetes type 2. Institutions should promote the implementation and also propose to make a guideline for other types of food. For example, lower the amount of carbs and add a gluten-free menu. What do you think? I totally agree. I think that besides not selling or just promoting junk food and sugar drinks in schools, I think that institutions should also educate children about healthy eating and the benefits of doing daily physical exercise. And I think it will be very interesting to promote um, uh, activities like the value of agriculture, agric agriculture, buying local products and learning how to prepare your own food. And Andy, what do you think if national governments make some tutorial videos uh, of what to make for kids, such as how to make a balanced and healthy meals with diabetes standards for people who are working in school cantina? I think that's a really great idea to spread awareness too. Um, let's remember that school is the second place where children learn about life and good habits. To change the outlook, I think it's really important that schools and all government ministries or departments collaborate together to generate change across all society. Great said, Andy. Thanks for letting us share our experience with you. We'll participate in Q&A at the end of the webinar if you will have any questions for us. Yes, thank you and over to you again, Joel. I'd like to thank Andrea Inês for explaining why governments need to take sure that educational diabetes and LD habits are present in schools, because it's very relevant, as I, I want to see uh, in a few seconds. And we would like to talk now a bit more about the KISS project and the advocacy toolkit. We would like to start by saying a few words about the the, the, the scene of diabetes in the in the youth worldwide. We uh, at IDF estimate that there are more than 1.1 million children, adolescents, and young adults under 20 years old that live with type 1 diabetes. And of course, the type 2 diabetes amongst the youngsters are uh, becoming a major problem, a global public health problem, because we are now seeing the numbers of youngsters with type 2 growing worldwide. And that's why we this, the, the kids project is so relevant because we need to make sure that prevention measures and healthy habits are implemented worldwide. That's, only, that's the only way forward to bend the curve of type 2 diabetes. And of course, schools are the environment where our children spend a lot of hours, and the schools are highly relevant to, uh, to, to make this change, of course. That's why the kids' projects are uh, so highly relevant. Then uh, about the kids project, a few words, uh, IDF uh, and ESPAD uh, come together to develop the, the kids project, which was supported since the, the beginning by, by Sanofi. And then it was, um, it started in Brazil and India when we had the first pilot with the support of these four organizations. The, sec the, the, the first two ones are coming from Brazil and the, the, the last two ones from India. And there, were, there are two models of implementing kids 
um, the ad hoc sessions which we had in over 45 countries and then the structured um, uh, the structured um, way of implementing kids and you can see the numbers of uh, activities and the number of people that we have reached out with these two type of, of implementing structure uh, the, then what the kids uh, has uh, it's a we have a um, um, the kids resources that can be freely downloaded from the web website and I uh, I um, I would like to ask you all to download the kids resources. First of all, we have the kids information pack and the nutrition guide and the, and the quiz, a web quiz on nutrition, of course. Um, the kids information pack is translated in eighteen different languages, and it's a it's a powerful tool for schools to to know better what is diabetes and to raise awareness on diabetes in schools. And of course, uh, the Kids Advocacy Toolkit that we are going to explain a little bit more in detail in the next minutes. Uh, that's the, the, the Advocacy Toolkit is um, also highly relevant because it's, uh, it's uh, powerful, helpful to those that uh, would like to have advocacy campaigns. And it's, uh, it's a compilation of tips to help advocates uh, it's, uh, it addresses um, everyone that is interested in promoting an healthy lifestyle and a stigma-free school environment. And then I, I would like to pass to, to Bruno and Beatrice that are working at the IDF in youth and youth issues. Thank you, you all, for, for the introduction and also for your support to IBF by hosting this webinar today. We really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Beatriz Diagnet Jimenez, and I'm the advocacy manager at the IDF uh, executive office in Brussels, although I am originally from Spain, and I'm here with my colleague Bruno. Thank you very much, Bea. It's a great pleasure to be here. My name is Bruno Helman. I'm current based in Brazil, and I'm Kids Project Coordinator. And today, as um, Joao was mentioning before, we are going to be talking about how to advocate uh, for the kids project and better education and prevention in schools using the uh, advocacy toolkit that IDF launched earlier in 2021. But uh, Bruno and I are not going to be talking about this toolkit on our own. We are going to have four uh, amazing advocates for the two, from the two IDF networks of people living with diabetes that are going to be having a conversation uh, with us about how to uh, advocate for the implementation of kids at the national level. We're going to have today Sara Bijinsika, who is a young leader in diabetes from Uganda, Bruno Carratini, who is also a young leader in diabetes from Uruguay, Renza Svilia, who is a Blue Circle Voice from Australia, and also Lupu, Nupur Lalvani, who is a Blue Circle Voice from India. And we are going to start the conversation with Sarah. Hello, Sarah, how are you doing? Um, hello, Beatrice, thank you. Um, my name is Sarah V. Zika. I'm from a beautiful country called Uganda. Um, 28 years old, and I've been living with type 1 diabetes for almost 15 years now. Um, I've been an act, uh, active advocate um, with my blog site called the Ugandan Diabetic and my member association plus uh, volunteering with uh, a patient organization called Africa Diabetes Alliance. Uh, I'm also a member of the YLD since 2019. Thank you, Sarah. And it has been amazing to collaborate with you in the YLD project. So uh, the first uh, thing that we are going to, to be talking about is the first step of the uh, Kids Advocacy Toolkit, which is about identifying gaps in education and prevention. So Sarah, you were saying that you are an advocate yourself, uh, not talking even about kids already. What is the first thing that any advocate for any type of activity needs to do? Where could you start your advocacy journey? Uh, the, first, the first thing any advocate would, would definitely have to do is research, you know, um, find out the gaps in your country and uh, the main problem. And you can use uh, reliable data like the IDF Atlas, which has uh, data estimates and uh, projections. And uh, these figures will, will guide you and um, 
uh, be very relevant in your advocacy journey as an advocate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely it's very important to, to know what we're talking about when we are advocating. Uh, the main uh, objective of advocacy is to convince policymakers uh, and governments to make change. Uh, but many of them may think, okay, why I need to act uh, in diabetes? Why is diabetes education important? However, all the governments have signed some international commitments, right? Yes, they have. Yes, they have. And... Um uh, they have all done that with the uh, uh, World Health Organization and UN. Uh, uh, for instance, I was lucky to attend a, a dia uh, dialogue back in 2018 with the help of my member association. So, uh, national. And uh, actually, our Uganda Minister for Health was pre um, present in that dialogue. So um, if you have an opportunity to, to, to search for these um, um, conversations and be a part of them, uh, it would be very great because um, governments do, do make commitments. Um, even in the UN, the, uh, countries make uh, all the countries made commitments um, to achieve universal health coverage by 2030 and also provide 80 percent coverage for uh, essential medicines for people living with non-communicable diseases by 2025 so you just have to make sure that uh, your your government um, are accountable to all these commitments they are making mm -hmm. Yeah, as you're saying, it's true that there are a lot of international commitments, uh, but now it's the time to turn all of these commitments in paper to real actions, and that's why the role of advocates is uh, it's so important. Uh, now, talking concretely about advocating for kids, um, what would you recommend an advocate, a person that wants to start doing kids' advocacy, to do? What should be the first thing? Uh, the first thing would be to check out the NCD country profiles. Um, to make sure that your country is, you know, uh, is working on the targets they they they, they, they agreed to, to to work on, and also you can do additional research on your country's um, progress on uh, uh, providing diabetes education, their current actions on uh, making sure that healthy lifestyles are promoted in schools. And all this information you can get on government websites like Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education, and then you start from there and build um, your goals and as an advocate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. That's a great tip. And we really believe that all this initial research is super important, really, before you start the uh, uh, the actual advocacy work. And we're going to start talking about this advocacy work uh, now on the step two of the toolkit, which is about setting the advocacy goal. So once we have done this research, it's the moment to decide what we want to do as advocates uh, but sometimes it's very difficult to tell the difference between an advocacy goal and an objective right yes 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 it's very difficult but the simple the simple thing you can do as an advocate is well a goal is the ultimate um desired outcome of what you want to achieve whereas um um uh, uh, uh objectives are intermediate steps uh, that you that can help you attain the goal you want, and um, unlike unlike goals, objectives uh, um, have to be specific. They have to be manageable. Um, they have to be sure measurable. They have to be attainable. They have um, you know um, they have to be relatable to the goal that you want to achieve. But most importantly, they have to be time bound. You have to set. Um, um, timelines and uh, when the when the um, objectives should be should be achieved. So that would that, that is the difference you can follow in terms of goals and objectives. Mm -hmm. It's very diff uh, important, sorry, uh, really to differentiate between goals and objectives. And we are going to be talking about objectives uh, a bit later. But talking now about goals, knowing that. Uh, the kids project is focused on schools, on education, on healthy habits. Uh, what do you think should be the primary goal for anyone that is working on the kids project? Uh, the primary goal should be for countries to improve their education 
um, and promote healthy habits in schools. Um, so uh, development of, of policies and implementation of, um, of um, programs like the kids, you know, that should be the primary goal for any ad uh, in regards to the kids, um, kids, uh, pro uh, kids program. Mm -hmm. But of course, the situation in different countries it's, it's, has nothing to do. So you are from Uganda. We're going to have panelists today that are from Australia, from Uruguay, from India. The situation changes a lot. So uh, do you think one goal fits all the situations, all the different national um, approaches? Uh, of course not. Of course not. Uh, there, should be, there should be an overall goal. Um, however, advocates can still set um, secondary goals that, um, that, that, that are in line with um, their, main, um, their main gaps in their countries. For example, if, if your, your, main, your main problem or main gap in your country is uh, type 1 awareness, uh, your goal could be to stop discrimination and stigmatization they're living with their victims in school uh, through the implementation of the kids um, um, project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you a lot, Sarah, for, for sharing all your tips. Uh, we are going to continue talking now about the rest of the um, uh, of the steps of the advocacy toolkit of the kids project uh, but we remind all the attendees that we're going to have a Q&A at the end of, uh, of this webinar and Sarah and the rest of the panelists are going to be there so if you have any question from them uh, please uh, leave that on the chat and then we will address all of them in the Q&A and now over to you Bruno. Thanks, Sarah, for your great contribution. Now it's my great pleasure to invite my dear friend and advocate comrade Bruno Caratini, who is a YLD member from Uruguay. Thanks for joining us today, Bruno. Over to you. Hi, Bruno. Hi. How are you? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bruno. I am from Uruguay, uh, Latin America. I have been living with Taiwan diabetes for 15 years now. And I have been advocating for diabetes for about 12 years. So I'm very happy to be here and contribute to this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Bruno. So moving on to our next step from the Kids Advocacy Toolkit. Uh, so building partnerships, like starting with advocacy can be overwhelming, especially if you are initiating on this, uh, on this path. So why would you say it's important to build partnerships? That's a very good question. Uh, it is important to maximize resources, to increase successful rates, to bring diversity and legitimacy. Uh, since since co kids covers aspects such as education, health promotion, nutrition, and children's rights, there will, there will be a long list of factors that you can uh, engage in your uh, kids' advocacy, uh, including people living with diabetes, carers of people who live with diabetes, primary healthcare professionals, local diabetes associations, those are some examples. And of course, uh, policymakers and the, and the private sector, this can be a challenge, but there, there are potential stakeholders. So you mentioned about, uh, you mentioned about uh, people living with diabetes and uh, those that care, uh, take care of them. Uh, in your opinion, like, uh, really straightforward. Why do you think it's important to involve those uh, in your advocacy strategy? Okay. When you're uh, advocating for a cause regarding the, the whole diabetes spectrum of targets such as uh, awareness or education or all the other, it is on the plan to involve people who are directly affected by it uh, because of the importance of lived experience. Uh, they can help reaching out the target audience. Make sure that your kids' advocacy strategy meaningfully involves people living with uh, and affected by by diabetes. That's another challenge to get people uh, who is affected by diabetes to get meaningfully involved in the in the advocacy task force. But it is really important because uh, they have the lived experience. And is there any type of uh, care that 
uh, people need to take into consideration when choosing their uh, advocacy partners? Yes, Bruno, there is. Uh, you, you, you must avoid a conflict of interest, especially if you're considering collaborating with the private sector. As I mentioned before, that's a potential stakeholder. You need to make sure that you have to avoid any potential conflict of interest. Uh, this, this is an important matter. Uh, sometimes, sometimes the industry uh, have their own interest, uh, commercial interest, and they go against your project uh, because uh, if, if we say some examples, uh, industry health, unhealthy products such as uh, industries of sugar sweetened beverage or, or ultra processed foods, uh, who are actually risk factors for the development of diabetes, uh, that that could be a, 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 an example of, of conflict of interest. So you need to be really careful when you choose your uh, your potential uh, ally, allies. Thanks for, for raising this flag. So moving on on our uh, next step. Uh, in the end of the day, advocacy is about uh, convincing, but also finding like common narratives to generate positive impact, especially on the kids framework when we are dealing with uh, the school environment and about the, 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 the promotion of uh, inclusion and combat of stigma, but also promoting a, a healthy environment for all. Uh, so, how would you say are the main people that could help you with the kids' implementation? Well, that's a very interesting question. The main, the main audience uh, will be decision makers, uh, those that can actually make change happen, uh, national or local government, ministries, parliamentaries, uh, if we're talking about the framework work of our kids, school members association are also a primary decision maker. Uh, they have the capacity to implement this project across a large number of schools. So that's one important to consider as well. But it's not always easy to reach out to decision makers. What our listeners and viewers can do in order to, to help them uh, to, to reach out to decision makers? Well, um, there is a secondary audience as well. Uh, as you mentioned, this can be tricky, but w you can always count with the, the influencers uh, who can support and mobilize decision makers. Uh, when we talk about influencers, we talk about people who have organizations who advise or have the capacity to persuade primary decision makers. So this include opinion leaders, uh, celebrity and public figures. We have experience here in Uruguay working in these matters. So uh, a clear group of influencers for kids, of course, are uh, parents, associations, teachers, students, unions. They can help you convince governments in the need to implement uh, the kids project in schools. But there's like always uh, limitations, especially in terms of time and funds. So what do they can do in order to optimize the, the, the outreach of their target audience? This is also a challenge, Bruno. Uh, I would recommend advocates to, to, for starts, they use the power mapping tool. Uh, power mapping, mapping can uh, help you identify your actual target audience. Uh, uh, for each player, you need to set uh, and ask yourself if they are in favor or against the key objectives and how much power influence they have in terms of your goal. It is important to consider that uh, power mapping, power mapping, I'm sorry, needs to be uh, dynamic and, and needs to frequently be updated in order to be efficient. Perfect. This is a really useful and important uh, tool that we highly recommend everyone to use. So, okay. We have talked about like the people that we want to reach out, but exactly we need to define what we want. So moving on to our next uh, step, what would you say in order to, to, to achieve your goal? What should be the first step to advocate to plan what they actually want to do in order to achieve that goal? 
Well, the first step it should be, uh, well, I recommend uh, it should be advocate's objective. You need to set uh, short, shorter term objectives. Uh, this also can be really overwhelming, but you need to prioritize your objectives. I really, really recommend the uh, smart objectives tool uh, to be able to track progress. That's the, the main goal. So uh, SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Time-bound. That's a really, really helpful tool to be able to track progress, Bruno. But is it easy, Bruno, to, to, to set the SMART objects? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Is it, is it easy to advocate to set their SMART objectives? Well, uh, no. <laughs> Smart objectives sometimes can be can be complicated, at least when you're new to the uh, advocacy and objective setting. So uh, I would recommend advocates work together. You can always consult with other people who have experience advocating with the Smart objectives. And uh, before you move forward, you just be sure that your your shorter term Smart objectives are very well designed and planned because otherwise you're gonna be moving forward and, and, and this, that's going to be a, a milestone stone in your, in your path. Thank you. Thank you very much. And in order to, to wrap up, uh, could you please give a concrete uh, example what would be a smart objective for the kids framework? Yes, uh, so, so an example would be like, uh, we're talking about diabetes advocacy, and particularly these uh, kids, the two, two kids uh, advocacy, and, and smart objectives could be uh, mobilize your network to get at least a thousand people signing a petition to include diabetes education and the promotion of healthy habits in school curricula uh, by the end of the year. Um, it is specific because uh, it includes kids' education, and this particularly two kids. Uh, it is measurable. We're talking about a, a thousand people signing. Uh, it is attainable because you you only have to sign a petition, uh, and it's relevant because it will move forward this project into school curricula. And it is time bound because uh, we, we're talking about uh, the end of the year. So. Uh, this this is a very clear example of a smart short-term objective perfect and before we wrap up so we we see that's also important uh ad divide the advocacy work into phases uh why is that important because uh you know achieving change often uh, take years. Uh, advocates need to prioritize the activities uh, that could yield better outcomes. I think about dividing their advocacy into different phases. You need to be patient. Uh, this is a mandatory for people who have to dive in the advocacy work. Patience is a must. And uh, you can move to planning and following phase with more ambitious set of objectives if you're patient. Patience. So, uh, it is important that you, you divide your advocacy work into different phases and track them all in a, in a dynamic sense of way. Thank you very much, Bruno. It's always lovely uh, to hear, but also to learn from you. Uh, I just would like to, to remind everyone that we will have our panelists answering questions right after uh, the end of our presentation. So thank you very much, Bruno. And now it's over to you, Bea. Okay, so thank you to the to the two Brunos to, to guide us through these uh, three steps of the Kids Advocacy Toolkit. Uh, now we're going to be talking with Renza Aspilia, who is a Blue Circle Voice from Australia. Hello, Renza, how are you? Oh, Beatrice, it's so good to see you. I'm well, thanks for inviting me to chat with you today. Yeah, thanks a lot for joining us today. So if you want to introduce yourself briefly, although I know that a lot of people in this webinar already know you very well. Uh, my name is Renza Shabilia. I'm from Melbourne, Australia. I've lived with type 1 diabetes now for 23 years. Uh, and I've been a Blue Circle voice for probably about, I think, oh gosh, maybe the last five or six years. 
Um, I, I guess I've been advocating, I started working in diabetes organisations three years after I was diagnosed with diabetes and, and I've always had advocacy roles in my diabetes organisation roles and I also do a lot of advocacy and activism, I guess, outside of that with the um, writing I do and, and public speaking that I do as well. Thanks a lot for that, Vanessa. So we're going to be talking with you about the, message, the messages and the messengers. So the step six of the toolkit is shaping uh, your advocacy uh, messages. We have been talking already about all the research that we need to do previously, uh, setting the goals, the objectives, et cetera. But messages are very important. Why do you think messages are that important in advocacy? Messages are everything. Our stories are everything. And so we need to know that what we're able to get across resonates with the people who we're sharing this message with. So we can just advocate by just throwing facts at people, but that's never going to be enough. We need really strong messaging that, that tells the story, explains why it's important, and really highlights just what it is that we want as well. So it's got to be very clear what it is that, that we're trying to get across there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were saying that actually a message needs to include all of these. Uh, what makes a good message for you, if you can develop a bit more uh, that? Yeah, I, so one way that I talk about it that I think um, is really useful to think about is you need to win people's hearts and you need to win their minds, okay? So when we're talking about data and statistics, that, that talks up here, right? So that's where we can really put our case forward super strongly because we've got evidence to back up what we need. And that's really, really important, especially when you're talking to policymakers or to people who are holding the, the purse strings and want to know how much things are going to cost. They want to know the data. But where it then becomes super really meaningful is when you can then win people's hearts and that's where you tell the stories that's where you talk about how it makes a change to people's lives it's where you talk about how meaningful things are it's where you tell the story of what diabetes is so when we're talking about you know kids in schools we hear from these kids in schools and we hear their stories and we have what they're saying backed up then with evidence so it's having those two things together that are really important and being really clear about what your ask is as well i think that that's always, you know, really critical. You know, you don't just want to go in there without people then walking away going, right, I know what they want. So you've got to be very clear about what it is that you're wanting the people who you're advocating to, how you want them to act. So being clear, being concise, and always remembering that those two bits, the hearts and the minds bit, are really critical to bring it all together. Yeah, thanks for that. And it's true that I have seen a lot of almost perfect messages out there but that do not really mention what we want from the target audience and that's super important if you are not clear with that you are not going to get a reaction from them and it's them who we need to uh, to react uh yes we have been talking a lot about the need to to tailor uh right all the advocacy work that yeah. we do one solution does not feel does not fit all situations yeah. a message fits all situations our message is universal Never. <laughs> I mean, how good though would it be if, you, if we all yeah. had just one message and we just had to keep saying that? And it'd be so easy. We could just be repeating the same words all the time, but that's never going to be the case. So it's, you know, a lot of the work that I do is um, talking with healthcare professionals. So that's, I speak in a really different way or use really different messages when I'm speaking to healthcare makers as compared with if I'm speaking to policy makers. So if I'm talking with healthcare professionals about diabetes and they're diabetes healthcare professionals, they know diabetes, right? So I don't need to go in and do a bit of a diabetes 101. If I'm talking to policy makers, they've often got no idea about diabetes. They've, they've got this really superficial idea that's usually wrong. So you kind of need to dial back, you know, never using jargon, never using, um, never assume that they're going to know what you're talking about. So knowing your audience is always the starting. It's a really, really key start point. Okay, so know who it is 
who's listening to what you're saying and break things down into bite-sized chunks. Um, the way that I always think about it, and you know, we do a lot of this at Diabetes Australia because a lot of the work we do might be for the media, for example. So the advocacy is we've managed to get a news crew there. They're putting a camera in front of us and they're gonna ask us some questions. We've got to get the sound bite. It's the one sentence that conveys what it is that we're asking and what the message is that's gonna make the six o'clock news. So you've got to be able to have those sorts of really neat and tidy little messages that you can get across to people. But the key, key thing is, is know your audience, know what their understanding of the topic is and play to them. So again, if it's for the general community, those stories are really, really critically important. If it's the policymakers, they want the data, but you've got to build it all in together so that you're telling it all, but you kind of need to tailor it depending who it is that, that you're talking to. Yeah, thanks for that, Prince. It's a great tip. And in terms of delivering the message, now once you have already crafted your message, depending on the audience, uh, which type of channel do you think is best? It's, it's the, the best one to deliver the kids-related messages. Every single one you possibly can. Being able to get the message out as widely as possible, I always think, is really important. But you do need to be smart about it. So. A lot of that comes down to the resources and the timing and the energy that you've got. But I always think that it's really important to go, you know, if you're developing um, a communication strategy, for example, and that sounds like a really fancy thing to do, but it doesn't need to be. It's not like you need to be a communications expert to do that. It's just who do you want to listen to your story? How do you want them to hear it? And what are the key bits, right? Um, but go as wide as you can and use your network. So one of the things that's been really, I think really amazing with what we've done at Diabetes Australia is we use digital platforms really well. We use the diabetes community to share what it is that we're doing. Um, and when you've got a really strong message, a great advocacy message that everybody goes, hey, that's really cool. I want to talk about that. They will share it. And there's your sort of free messaging getting out there. Social media is brilliant because it's cost effective. It can reach great channels. People can easily share it. Um, you don't need to be a super whiz at any you know, particular program. Um, but, but talking in and using your networks is a really, really great way to get your message out as widely as you possibly can. But you've also got to remember, you know, just as you're, especially when it's you're asking for an advocacy, um, when your advocacy ask is around policy, you've got to be able to get it to the policy makers. So being smart about that, using diabetes, local diabetes organisations, using the information that the IDF has, um, that sort of stuff is really, it, it puts your message in a really strong position. So, you know, again, tailor your message, tailor what you're delivering to the audience and, and be really smart about the way you do it. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's really important. We, we get a lot of messages sometimes from people who are new to advocacy or who do not have a lot of funds to the advocacy, sometimes even no funds at all. And they yes. are saying, look, I don't know what to do. So in these cases, I think social media is perfect. And I think also yep. social media has proven, well, how important it is over the, the last year and a half with the pandemic and all the situation yep. that we have been living, no face-to-face -face meetings. I think, yeah, this is uh, this shows uh, how important social media is for, for any community and for the diabetes one in this case. Great, yeah, so absolutely. now... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to say, I mean, when you look at the diabetes community in particular, the diabetes online community is a force to be reckoned with. It, it, there is so much power in that community. And one of the things that's amazing is that people will jump on board important advocacy issues. We have seen that time and time and time again when there's been something um, that people really, you know, can embrace and can get behind, they will. So use that community because, you know, a great bunch of people. Yeah, yeah, and that's why we met you and a lot of other Blue Circle Voice members, so definitely. Right, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have been talking about the messages, and now we need to talk about who are going to be delivering those messages. Uh, so, what do you think makes a good advocacy messenger? Yeah, so I will tell um, just a really quick story about something that I think is really powerful, and that is when you, you know how I spoke about that hearts and minds things? So where that works beautifully is when you've got, say, a researcher 
or somebody who has developed, um, you know, a resource. Um, and then you've got somebody telling the story about why that research or why that resource is really, really important. Okay. So an example that I've given about that is that we've done a lot of work around the language, the words that when communication that we use when we're talking about diabetes. So I get up there and I talk about why this is important. Why as a person with diabetes, I need to feel empowered, included, not judged, not stigmatized, but I'm just one person telling my story. But then we bring up a researcher who's done research in this and says, hey, here's the evidence to back up what she just said. You can't ignore it. So when I'm talking about, you know, bringing together and really adding to an advocacy message, it's bringing different stakeholders together who have different um, takes on things, different areas of expertise, to but, but all with the same message in the end, which is whatever the advocacy issue is, but can talk about it in different ways. So I think that that's a really important thing is to you know, surround yourself with people who I guess are, um, you know, experts in what they do. And then the other thing that I think is really important is that authenticity. So if you are telling your story, no one can tell you how to say it or what to say. Um, that authenticity is so, so, so critical. Um, we get better at telling our story when we've got practice because, you know, we get less nervous, we become more confident, we know what gets a reaction. So that's what we often, you know, we use the same words. Um, so sometimes, you know, what makes a good um, messenger is somebody who has been doing it for a little bit and is confident to stand up there and, and do it. Um, but really, we just want to hear stories. That's what makes it meaningful. So never think that your story isn't enough. Never think that you don't have something contrib to contribute because you absolutely do. Great. Thank you, Renza. One last question for you. So we are talking today about kids specifically. Yes. So you know the project very well. Who do you think, do you have a couple of examples of people who could be good messengers for kids? Kids. Kids, kids, kids. <laughs> I think that there's no, I, I know. I think that there is really an important message to be told of the people who are, I guess, are directly affected. So, you know, hearing from kids and hearing from kids doesn't necessarily mean they have to stand up in front of a microphone. They can draw pictures, they can tell their stories in any way, they can sing songs, whatever it is. But then from there, there's more. We want to hear about, you know, schools where this message has already gone in and just how it's changed the thinking and the lives of people. Parents, let's hear from parents as well. Let's hear from health professionals who have had input in this. Um, when, where I said, you know, you go out to as many stakeholders, people who are involved in the project who can share their stories, they're the ones who are critical, especially if they've got that personal connection. That personal connection makes it real. And that's what you want. That's often what hits the nerve and gets people to sit up and go, yeah, all right, I'm behind this. It's because they've heard the story and they understand how it connects to a person. Yeah, it's great that you mentioned that. And actually, uh, what we are inviting at the end of this webinar, we're going to share with everyone the link uh, to the kids' yes, web page to those of you who are not familiar with the project yet. We have there quite a few testimonials. We have Sarah's testimonials. We have talked before uh, with her. And then we also have a couple of testimonials of videos of children living with diabetes and parents of children living with diabetes also. So yes. definitely, as you're saying, it's very important to count on their experience. And that's uh, yeah, something very powerful that we need to use. Thanks a lot, yeah. Gwensa, for supporting oh, us today. Thank you. Thanks so much. See you later. Yeah, Bye -bye. it was great. Yeah, so just a reminder to all the, the attendees to the webinar, uh, Rensa is going to stay with us uh, for a few more minutes. And yeah, very soon we're going to be starting the um, Q&A that is going to be moderated by Joel. So now over to you, Bruno. Thank you very much, Bea. Thank you very much, Renza. It's always inspiring to listen from you. So now it's my great pleasure to invite my dear friend, Nupur Lovani, who is a BCV member from India. So now I kindly ask you to briefly introduce Nupur. Thank you, Bruno. Um, thank you for having me here today. So my name is Nupur. I live in India. Um, and I've had type 1 diabetes since the past 26 years. Um, I am a part of the IDF's Blue Circle Voices. Um, and here in India, I run the Blue Circle Diabetes Foundation. Thank you. And definitely Nupuri is one of uh, the prominent voices of our community world, uh, worldwide. So Nupur, we have talked about 
goals, objectives, uh, messaging messengers, but now, now let's put our hands into practice. So let's talk about activities. Like, how do you see the link between the objectives that we have previously talked and the activities that need to be developed in order to to reach out our uh, advocacy strategy. Thanks, Bruno. Um, and I, I firstly, you know, I want to say that it's a really good idea to sit down and break down this advocacy into 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 compartments so that, you know, everyone who's um, who's out there and uh, wanting to be uh, making a difference can uh, can learn from it. Um, so I feel that advocates should have a very clear and limited, you know, maybe three or four um, major objectives for each of their advocacy phases. Um, and then linked with those objectives, they could have um, maybe two or three activities per objective. So, you know, for example, if the objective is to influence a policymaker, um, the the associated um, activity could be, you know, maybe to write an open letter to your minister or, um, you know, to reach out uh, to them personally and go and meet them and um, uh, talk about the issue that you would like to highlight. Um, so I think a wonderful resource that um, IDF has is the uh, Kids and Diabetes in Schools um, Advocacy Toolkit. And I would really urge all our friends to, uh, you know, take a look at that resource. And uh, it's got it's got some beautiful information that is going to be very, very helpful. Thank you. So one way of uh, defining your, your activities uh, is to to start with a plan, but how and where to start a plan? Yes. So um, sometimes, you know, it's so overwhelming um, and uh, we, we all start out with a, a grand big plan and, and to be able to see it through and to be able to um, see it through its logical end and uh, its completion. Um, I think one tip uh, is that one could use an um, an international day such as uh, World Diabetes Day, of course, which is coming up um, in November, and um, other international days like World Health Day or International Youth Day or Teachers Day. So these are a great starting point to um, you know to begin the conversation and and uh, naturally the work that you do um, leading up to these days is is going to then culminate in um, you know something it, it is a plan that you seen through. So if we're talking about World Diabetes Day, that means you've started working from, let's say, August or September and, um, you know, leading up to November, you've come up, you've made a plan and um, you've executed your activity. That's that's great. And yeah, so just stay tuned and uh, keep in mind that World Diabetes Day and uh, is is coming soon and we the, definitely IDF will be promoting a lot of different initiatives on our social media channels. So when it comes to giving an example, something that you have seen or that you have uh, applied personally uh, when advocating for, for kids and when implementing kids, uh, what would be uh, an example of activity that would go towards that uh, smart objective, for example. Yeah. Um, so I think the the smart objective is a really um, important parameter to be able to measure. You know um, where you've started and uh, where you want to be. Um, so a few examples could be, uh, you know, coming up with a petition um, in your, um, and of course these would then change um, depending on your, uh, on the issues that you face in your region or your country. Um, so one could be, you know, starting a petition and inviting people to um, sign it um, and people like like us, you know, people that live with uh, type 1 diabetes or different types of diabetes, that could be one thing. Um, another could be, you know, um, talking about healthy eating and the importance of exercise and healthy habits in schools, because uh, these days we see a lot of young children um, being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes as well. Um, so 
these can be certain um, objectives that uh, that one could sort of pick on and um, you know use the smart uh, goal parameter to see through and what do you have to do in order to 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 develop to set uh, uh, an activity plan so um, I think the most important thing is to think of a timeline um, you know so if I had to think of um, an activity that I want to launch on let's say World Diabetes Day um, so I've set myself a deadline and then I work backwards um, you know so that I achieve it um, another important thing, and, and sometimes we're all guilty of this, um, you know, we want we want to take on all the responsibility ourselves and uh, because we're enthusiastic and we're, um, you know, we feel passionately about it. But it's also very important to uh, be able to assign responsibilities and delegate work. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that would like to help. Um, and it's important that, um, you know, you set out and assign roles to each team member. Um, it's also it's also key to, um, you know, to uh, sort of work together with your advocacy partners and, um, you know, uh, use their help and expertise to be able to further your cause. So you may need um, you may need people with a lot of skills. You may need uh, people that are that have expertise in communication or in uh, you know with social media or with uh, managing people, uh, managing finances. So I think all of these things are important. And last but not the least, um, you know, um, have a backup plan and assess your risk. So um, there will always be roadblocks in uh, whatever you embark on, and it's very important to to recognize that fact. You know, you may run out of funds, you may not have the support you want, um, you may, uh, you know, deal with uh, bureaucracy, and there are solutions to all problems. So once you identify potential challenges and roadblocks, um, you know, you you can then go ahead and. Um, keep working on your target and uh, it's very important to remember that that major change takes years to happen so it's not something that happens overnight it's all our advocacy efforts together that um, that lead to change in the future thanks for that Nupur. Uh, you know that often that we we have navigated a, a long path and people think that that's it but there's a a last but not least really important step that is measure and report your results. So why you say it's a, it's a mistake, uh, as I said before, uh, often make that people don't measure the impact of their activities. Yeah, so, you know, Bruno, I am guilty of this myself. Uh, you know, I, um, I've i gone through the same and I often, you know, I also do repeat this mistake sometimes when, um, you know, you feel like you've accomplished a great task by finishing your activity and, um, and you know, there it ends. But really, uh, like you said correctly, that's not the end. Um, it, it's very important to measure progress because that helps you understand whether you've been successful in achieving your, um, you know, your your objectives and your activities or not. And, um, you know, there is no, um, one shouldn't really fear failure because I think um, it's a great, um, like they say, it's a stepping stone and, and some things work and some things don't work. But if you don't measure how you've done, uh, there is no scope for improvement in the future. So um, if you've had challenges, if you've had problems, um, it's important to understand where those came from and how to resolve them in the future. And so after measuring your your results and your parameters uh we we need to report right we we need to uh somehow uh, make sure that we we record them and we can access them in the in the future uh, so why would you say it's important to to prepare a report of of the progress of what have worked and what have not worked 
So I think that, um, you know, like we sort of spoke about in the previous question as well, a lot of us tend to think that just implementing the activity is the end of it and I've done my work and that's it. But really, um, you know, there's a there's a second phase to the advocacy as well. And, um, you know, to be able to take things further and, and see their logical end, um, to be able to um, assess whether we have um, used the smart goals, the, the parameters that we set at the beginning. Um, you know, another important thing that comes into play is the funding. So reports are a great way to, um, you know, to show your funders what work you've been doing and um, why you need to continue doing it and why, you know, and what challenges you face, because let's be realistic, you know, the challenges are there, they're always going to be there. Um, so it's always a struggle, but it's really important to document and, uh, you know, to write down these reports because, you um, that's what's going to convince your funders and your strategic partners um, to be able to continue to support you in the future as well. Nupur, thank you very much. It's really, really thoughtful and really important everything you have shared here with us. So I would like to, to thank you once again. So I just remember, I, I just would like to, to remind everyone that uh, we will have the, the panelists uh, short, uh, answering uh, the audi audience questions soon. But before that, I would like to invite you and remind you to share all your progress, all your activities with IDF team. For us, it's really important to, to keep track and, and to, to see all the, the great work uh, our community uh, are doing worldwide. So either if you are live or you are watching this uh, recording, just remember to share your work with us and we'll be happy to promote on our social media channel and on the kids website. As you can see on the kids website, we have some uh, inspiring and successful stories and we'll be more than happy to share yours as well. So now, moving forward, would like to, to show a short video on the kids program and its progress. Boy, Nani, how are you? Four party get up, Dina. Teacher, give you something. That is, she taught the video. We take it. That is, she taught. Diabetes has become a major threat to health. While type 1 diabetes can't be avoided, type 2 diabetes can be prevented by improving the way of life. For that, schools can play a vital role in protecting children with diabetes and educating about healthy lifestyles early on. The kids program aims to foster a safe, supportive school environment for children with diabetes and to raise awareness about diabetes and the benefits of healthy diets and physical activities among school-age children. Chcemy wam opowiedzieć o pewnej chorobie, jaką jest cukrzyca. Kids is dedicated to children, parents, teachers, and school nurses. By engaging with policymakers and education authorities, organizing meetings in local communities, and providing educational resources to schools, KIDS helps fight against discrimination of children with type 1 diabetes and educates on healthy lifestyles. The educational material provided is very simple. It's easy for them to understand. It's very important for us to understand that if a patient becomes totally diabetic, if he is not properly counseled and not properly taken care of, he becomes a burden on the family. Diabetes mana naam khabo na sleli chare marpo tam kam na aaj kore burgya zau nae mana naam aaj prayat karte. The nataigal asasiya fil program ni badaat al sulukiyat tghayar. Marad sukari mish marad maji. Aarif na nushabo aaj. 
اصحابه بيلعبوا معاه سيريس فاسيس واتر I feel that students are the best tools to spread this message to the society. We want our country to free from diabetes. Program like kids create awareness among the children and it will make help them to keep good help in the future. Of course, we have a great value for the children. The children and the family know how they live with the sugar. They consider it a friend rather than a friend. Thank you. It is my my pleasure to open up the Q and A question session. Uh, we'll have around fifteen minutes to for the Q and A. Uh, please please feel free to put your questions in the Q and A box. We are try to answer uh, as many questions as we can. Of course, it will be impossible to answer all questions. So I would like to ask the all speakers to put your camera on just for us to see each other, which is much more interesting. Again, thank you all the attendees who have been sharing their experiences in many countries, Poland, in Austria, in other countries. This proves that diabetes education and prevention in schools is still needed in all countries. This is why IVF encourages an imp the implementation of kids at national level and in, in many countries as possible. So can, can you uh, put your cameras on? Uh, I would like to ask all speakers to put the cameras on just for, for us to, to start Q&A. We have had very interesting questions. Uh, we are going to start with uh, um, discrimination, which is still a problem worldwide. Uh, some people have shared in the chat box their experience with discrimination and stigma against children with diabetes in school. So uh, the question is, what do you think is key to address these misconceptions in school settings? Sarah, Sarah can you share with us your view? Um, one of the, the most important things when it comes to discrimination is um, uh, the key uh, resources would come in handy because uh, they, they, they give guidance, especially to school staff and uh, the students themselves. So it would be a great way uh, to end discrimination in schools. Um, share, um, use the, the kids project. Um, and also we can, um, we can stop it by using our own uh, passion experiences as people living with diabetes. You know, most of uh, the cases of discrimination come about due to inadequate information about diabetes in general. So uh, the person living with diabetes can address these misconceptions by providing the right information. And also, if the if, uh, if kids project are uh, implemented in schools, uh, this can also um, take away all the misinformation and the misconception and provide um, the right information about diabetes in general, and uh, also provide uh, a, safe and, um, uh, a safe environment for the children living with diabetes. Yeah, thank you. Because most of the times we are still having a lot of problems in schools for children with diabetes, and many times this is because the school uh, teacher and staff uh, are not aware of what is diabetes, and and not knowing what is diabetes uh, gives them the afraid of dealing with diabetes. Thank you for sharing your view, Sarah. Again, um, other people say have commented on the webinar that in Greece teachers are not allowed to give medication to students, including insulin. Uh, so what is which is a problem of course that that would be only possible if there is a school nurse which is not always the case so the question is that if there are nurses in schools in your countries so i would like to ask inish andy and bruno to give uh, your views net inish can you start off there are nurses in in in, in croatia in schools uh no <clears throat> we don't have like uh 
it's it's quite similar situation uh, in Greece and in Croatia, and uh, we are just fighting against it this in last year. So what we what we took under um, under the organization, we have filmed uh, one video of uh, three to five minutes of uh, doctors who who are explaining that giving uh, glucagon or shot any kind of uh, shots for diabetes it's a first ad for for these kids so in croatia um, teachers are like they must to give a first ad to kids so and in this case insulin and glucagon is a first ad to uh, to to for kids with diabetes so we are just um, trying to to see in the future what will happen on this case because of course, we don't have uh, nurses in all schools. We have nurses only in private schools. And we supposed to have nurses, but they are like split it to five to 10, to ten uh, uh, schools. And you cannot be in, in, uh, in on the time when, when, when they supposed to be in the school. So uh, we are giving uh, lex, uh, les lessons to, to coaches to uh, to teachers how to deal with glucagon shots and how to give a shot to to kids if they really need to yeah thank you so it's another it's another kind of discrimination between private and public schools in a way um, and in mexico what is the situation can you share with us please yes hello um in mexico it happens almost the same um in um, we have nurses but also just in private schools in public schools we don't have like uh, specific um nurses for uh, any any situation um so what our associations do is to train teachers too um about how to act in case of hypoglycemia hyperglycemia and in certain cases uh, even injecting a kid with diabetes um, but above all, um, by having contact with parents, uh, which is very important because, of course, um, teachers don't have all the information that they need about the, a, a kid's treatment. Um, and also, I think it's very important that we consider um, programs like this, like kids programs, because they give the uh, teachers and schools the tools that they need to, to help uh, children with diabetes. Okay, thank you. And uh, Bruno uh, Karati, do you want to, to step in as well to, to provide us with your uh, views on this? In Uruguay, for instance, there are nurses in schools. Uh, hello, Xiao and the rest of the panelists. Well, this is a cross-cutting problem in many countries. Um, here in Uruguay, we have the same situation, but what, what, we, what we did was uh, meet strategically with the departments of uh, children's rights within the structure of the Ministry of Education and Culture. So we prepared together uh, a pediatric diabetes guide booklet uh, in which we use the kids, the IDF project for teachers and, and all national educators. And it was transmitted as an official document that protect the necessary actions of the teachers uh, in face of a situation of a child with diabetes, especially hypoglycemia. But the middle ground that we were able to achieve uh, in principle was that there was a direct line for the primary education health unit to attend uh, everything related to diabetes. If a school teacher has an emergency, he can call directly to the health unit of, of the Ministry of Education and uh, a team of doctors will, will go as fast as they can. Uh, this is the first step. Remember, uh, as we spoke on the on the webinar, uh, we need to be patient and set smart smart goals uh, to ensure that all schools have a, a nurse. Maybe it is, um, in, it can be a matter of life uh, because if someone that should with diabetes has, an, has severe hypoglycemia and no one at school knows how to treat it, it might be and could be a, a major problem as you, you all know and we have to print it. That's why the kids' projects are so relevant. We have another question from Yotsana about involving people uh, not living with diabetes to equally participate and spread the message across to make a large part of, I'm understanding this question 
um, uh, involving people without diabetes and not being a parent of a children with diabetes, which per se, it's a motivation, a personal motivation to highly contribute uh, to diabetes. Uh, so how can we motivate them towards the cause to spread the knowledge further? Renza, can you um, provide us with your uh, view? Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question, actually, because I think that for us to get the message about diabetes out there, we need as many people in the general community, not just people in the diabetes community talking about it. Sometimes I think we're almost just talking to ourselves all the time. Um, so I think one of the things that's really important is having very um, clear and simple messages. That's something that's really, really critical. So just to give you an idea about something that I think is that, that I know has worked is we ran a campaign around um, the symptoms of type one diabetes to get it out there in the broader community. Now, if you're affected by type one diabetes, it's highly likely that you know what those symptoms are. Toilet, tired, thirsty, thinner, you know what those are. But we want people outside the diabetes world to know that. So we use people in the diabetes world to share it and then to ask their networks to share it and their networks to share it. And what we saw was that a, the people who we were seeing sharing it had absolutely no connection to diabetes at all. They had just seen it, they grasped onto it. Everyone knows someone with diabetes, even if it's just, you know, a work colleague or someone that they knew at school. So they will have a tiny interest in there. So if there is a campaign that is simple, that is easy to share, that's a really good way to get that, um, I guess, groundswell of people um, interested and, and helping with campaigns. Okay, thank you. It's a very it's a really interesting question because uh, as, as much as we can involve all community in, in, the, in diabetes, it will be, of course, uh, a more impactful, which is really interesting. Uh, one other question that we, we, we had is about the, the transition from the, the childhood uh, services to adult services. How, how can we um, how can we help out this transition and how can we do differently um, by your team support, by your team, diabetes team to support this transition? Bruno, can you share your views on that? How can we help out? Sometimes the transition to the adult services in diabetes is quite impactful for the children because uh, in some point in time, they find themselves lost in space in a different service or surrounded by people which are much older than them. So how, how can we help out in this transition? Well, this is uh, an advocacy tax uh, directly related to healthcare professionals. So uh, my advice is to uh, uh, support the goal of building uh, multidisciplinary teams that uh, are specifically uh, attended at that specifically attend people with diabetes. Uh, when we talk about uh, transitions from childhood to adulthood, we're talking about mostly type one diabetes. So uh, my advice is to advocate with healthcare professionals uh, and policymakers um, to make a statement that it is very, very important to have uh, a specific diabetes team, healthcare provider team uh, that in many cases is, is not the, the reality. So that's my advice. Okay, thank you uh, for, for your use. Uh, we have another question, which is quite interesting from Adrian Sanders, our uh, close friend from the network Politicians for Diabetes. And because I think it was uh, pointed out previously, uh, the need for getting involved with the politician and the position make decision makers. So to reach out uh, any public policy goal, you need support of politicians, of course, who can advocate within decision-making bodies. So how often do you communicate with politicians in order to identify and support those who could advocate on your behalf? Uh, Renza and Bruno, uh, can you say a few words? Of course, if there is a, a link between the, a bit between the politician and diabetes, it will be easier if the politician has diabetes, of course, it's easier, but but does not need to be the case always. Yeah, I think that this is a really great opportunity to use networks that are there. So if there is a, um, a, a Friends of Diabetes support um, or Friends of Diabetes group um, in local government or federal government or, you know, whatever, 
link in with there um, because I know that, that, that that's exactly right. They've all, there's already a group there that has an interest in diabetes. But one of the things that we are really very, um, you know, really encourage in Australia is that people speak with their local members of parliament. These are, you know, you're a constituent of somebody in your local area. They are there to work for you. So find, and, and often they do want to meet with their local constituents. So finding a way to speak with them. But again, it comes back to them being very clear why you're meeting with them. You know, if you want something specific about diabetes, whether it be, um, you know, increased access to a technology or to a medication or to better um, programs in schools, um, you, you need to be really clear about what that is. But um, I think that, you know, we've had some real wins in Australia around that. Our kids and schools program there was because, you know, we approached the federal government and they funded it. This is a brilliant, brilliant resource from the IDF that you can take and you can utilise to say this is this is something that, that is here. Can you help us get this into schools? Um, because having things mandated makes it a lot easier, obviously, um, and not needing to go back and start and create a project or a program from scratch is, is um, you know, brilliant. So taking anything that's already established and saying here is how we can adapt it and how we can use it is a really good way to do that. But use your local members of parliament and, and see how they can help you, um, but also any of those um, friends of diabetes groups that, that are often, um, you know, part, often bipartisan across different parties um, are really, really useful as well. Yeah, indeed. And Bruno, can you say a few words more? Yes, uh, Shoao. Sure. First of all, I second everything that Prince had just said. Um, political will is, is the big elephant of the room most of the times. Uh, it, it, my advice, it's important to know the, the, the agenda of the different political representatives of your country. Uh, as you all know, health uh, can be an important item on those agendas, especially when, when politicians are campaigning for, uh, for elections. So my advice is to use this agenda in favor of, of implementing communications on the topic of diabetes. And for example, its socioeconomic impact and how many people it's affected by. These are topics that policymakers are attracted by. So in my personal experience, it has been very useful. Use these, uh, these agendas in order to, to, to communicate about diabetes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I think the, the, the kids advocacy toolkit is uh, very useful uh, to do that. I mean, this, it's a piece of information that is quite useful. It gives you a lot of ideas on how to do it. And of course, uh, political will is the first step, but then is the second step is the implementation of the political will per se, because sometimes politicians are very willingness to, to do something, but at the end of the day, they only show good intentions and not really, uh, in really uh, actions, which we need to force them to do so. And now the last question from Ana Paula Gomes uh, about uh, industry, which is, uh, which for me is a, is a really widely relevant question because we are part of the same environment, diabetes environment. So what strategies could we use to be able to transform industry into partners? Because and the industry is part of our diabetes community as well. Nupu, do you want to, to, to step in and share your views? Sure, uh, thank you. So um, I think um, it, it's really important to, um, you know, the fact is that uh, industry, like you said, is a valid part and is, is a reality. Um, so uh, the example I'd like to share is, you know, of the kids advocacy program that um, that IDF is running um, and is supported by Sanofi, I think it's important to work together with industry um, so that the message reaches far and wide and um, the maximum number of people are impacted. So I think that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, works well for all stakeholders. And uh, I also noticed um, another question in the, um, you know, chat about, um, Indian schools and diabetes education. I'm, I'm not sure if that's covered, but uh, if it isn't, I'm happy to talk uh, for a minute about that as well. Yeah, yes, you can, you can yeah. step in, so, in the uh, short, in the short, because you need to, uh, you need enough. Yes, sure. Uh, so, you know, our, um, our schools here in India don't have a, uh, don't have a, a fixed module, but uh, uh, several NGOs and several um, uh, groups of uh, diabetes advocates like ours, 
um are you know we do go to government schools and private schools and um talk to the kids and the teachers about the various types of diabetes and you know what symptoms they should watch out for so this is uh, a little bit of work in progress yeah thank you okay thank you is coming from mohamed uh the question said that adults are able to take advice from from doctors but how can we make it possible for school children to follow doctor advices i think this question is linked with coping with diabetes and adherence to the treatment uh bruno can you uh answer this to this one please yes yes thank you shaw so for this uh it is important to to incorporate uh, advocacy objectives that involve framework agreements between different entities or parties such as uh, primary health and education facilities or institutions just to highlight an example uh, here in Uruguay uh, we managed to create an information booklet on diabetes uh, pediatric diabetes with the legal framework of teachers and how they can act in the event of uh, the diabetes situation in the school classroom So this was released as an official primary education document approved by the Ministry of Education and Culture here in Uruguay. So this booklet with the legal actions and management tool, which basically was based on on the IDF, IDF Kids project, uh, was spread to the whole teachers community through an official ministry network. So once the teachers feel uh, safe and uh, this is achieved, it is important that the child feel safe in the school environment and, uh, and and can follow the treatment prescribed by the treating medical team. So, but it is necessary to create a safe environment. So first we need to address the teachers and then uh, the kids so they feel safe with diabetes and also don't feel discriminated. That is also a big problem in the school environments. Secondly, um, for they to carry out uh, their treatment with total safety. Indeed, it's the, the you make. We need to make the school a safe environment to all kids with diabetes, and need to fight stigma and discrimination, which is still a huge problem um, around the globe. Um, then we have another question that um, is linked with a little bit linked with with the previous one. Uh, the, the the question is around teachers not be allowing not be allowed to give medication to student to students including insulin uh, only school nurses could give insulin to students but there is not always nurses in schools as we know so sara can you just let us know if there are nurses in schools in in your country and do you think this is important to have schools to have nurses in schools for instance Um, yes, it's important. For example, in Uganda, we do have nurses, but um, we do have nurses in schools, but um, most of them don't have uh, adequate information about diabetes. So should a child uh, with diabetes uh, happen to be in the school, uh, most of the nurses actually don't know how to help that child. They don't know, you know, in case of an emergency, what do you do? Um, what is diabetes in general, which type does the child have, so that um, information is still uh, um, uh, unavailable in schools. Um, so that's when uh, the kids program um, comes into play. If, if the program can be implemented, be very useful. Sir, I think we have lost you for for a few seconds uh, while we were answering. For instance, it is clearly important to have uh, 
staff of the schools train for treating, for instance, an hypoglycemia, which is a major event and can cause a lot of problems on kids. So I'm, I'm just curious. And uh, what about in, in India and Uruguay? Can you just, Nupur and Bruno, just uh, step in to, to, to inform us if there are any schools, nurses in schools in India and Uruguay? Um, so I'll go first. Um, so there are no nurses in schools. In, there are no nurses in public schools. Um, and some private schools have nurses, but uh, generally it's not the norm. So uh, the burden of, uh, of you know, uh, sort of taking care of the child with type 1 diabetes uh, falls on then the parents and, and, and their relationship with the teacher and the school, um, you know, um, authorities. Um, I've been a child, uh, I was diagnosed as a child when I was eight years old and, and uh, my parents um, sort of, you know, went and sat down with the teachers and the principals and, and informed them what. Uh, type 1 diabetes is all about so um, that's how you know we sail through school and that's what a lot of parents do here in India as well yeah thank you and in Uruguay Bruno so um, this is a this is a cross-cutting problem in many countries we, we don't have here school nurses in, uh, we don't have it uh, as many other countries but we, what, what we managed to achieve was to, to, to create this uh, direct line from school facilities to, to, to healthcare providers. So in case of uh, a diabetes situation and this compensation or, or a, a severe complication, uh, the teachers and the authorities of the health institutions can connect directly to an emergency so they can uh, attend the situation. This was one of the smart objectives that we were talking about uh, earlier in the, in the webinar. Uh, remember to, to have patients in the advocacy path. Uh, this can take a long time, but you, you need to set small, shorter objectives in order to, to achieve the goal. Yeah, in Portugal, we don't have also nurses in schools, which is a problem, of course, but if the, the school staff and teachers are educated, uh, in diabetes, they they would be able to, to at least to take care of the of the children with diabetes. Let's say, for instance, treating an hypoglycemia. Uh, another question that we had: uh, How many? How can somebody who does not have any relevant connections start off advocacy activities, considering the lack of interest in diabetes in schools? I mean, yet, how can we engage with with people? How can we uh, get together with people that are not connected with diabetes to get together and to create a larger movement? Uh, Nupur, can you take this on? Sure, thank you. Um, so a lot of us that are diabetes advocates today, uh, we also started out at some point uh, without really knowing how to, you know, how to how to navigate um, advocacy. Um, who to look up, uh, where to get support from. Um, so what I would suggest is um, look up your nearest community, your diabetes community that's close to you in your city or in your town. Um, connect with them, talk to them, make friends, um, you know, volunteer your time and effort with them. And um, whenever they have uh, programs that involve, um, you know, like going to schools, for example. So this is what we do in, uh, in India. We visit different cities and different public and private schools. And we, you know, we call for volunteers. And, and there are lots of people that come and help, um, you know, make a presentation in schools with us. So, so th these are ways that you can engage with um, your local communities. Yes, great. Thank you. And linked with that, we we need to ex expand also our activities throughout the politicians, throughout the decision making bodies. Uh, so we have another question linked with that. Uh, we have spoken about advocacy, advocating towards influencers and key opinion leaders. What about inv involving young influencers in promoting diabetes education so children can relate? Meaning that apart from people that are not really yet engaged, apart from the politicians that we need to engage with, uh, we need to engage with youngsters with diabetes, young influencers that can do really make a difference. Sarah, can we, can you elaborate a little bit more, please? Um, yes, there's that case, for example, me and Bruno are young leaders in diabetes, uh, which basically makes us young influencers. Uh, and uh, uh, we do a lot of uh, that countries, especially in schools. 
and uh, yeah, so social media can be used as a space um, to create uh, more awareness about diabetes. I have a blog where I share my own experiences uh, as a person living with diabetes. So these are all uh, other forms we can use as young people. Um, you can use social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, you can use your own personal spaces to, to, to um, uh, make sure the, uh, the general public, especially those that have access to the internet, um, can, can uh, be aware of diabetes. Thank you, and, uh, and I have to say that you are good examples of it. You are part of the young leaders and booster voices uh, from IDF. And I think, of course, the link that with that, if people can use the kids resources that are freely available to be downloaded, this will make uh, their job easier uh, to achieve the goals. And of course, using uh, or engaging with influencers uh, that are not the same age as the school children, but not in a, with the age not so far away from their age, it resonates more with them. It's easier to get them on board. And Bruno, just to, to complement this uh, uh, ecosystem of people that can be engaged in lobby activities, advocacy activities, uh, what about politicians? And how can we engage with the politicians? How can we engage with the decision-making bodies to help out in the system? Are they relevant to our job? Are they relevant in promoting diabetes in schools? What can be done to promote, to, 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 to engage with them, to, to have a larger uh, pool of people um, to help out? Yes, they are definitely uh, an important piece of the picture. Uh, okay, first of all, politicians, uh, as we always said, are, are the elephant in the room. So uh, political will, uh, to be more specific. So my advice is to, to study the agenda of the different political representatives. Uh, health, uh, such as Diabetes Matter and other NCDs uh, are a very important item, especially when politicians' campa campaigns are, are carried out. So my advice is to use this agenda in favor of implementing uh, communication on the topic of diabetes and, for example, the socioeconomic impact that diabetes has with other NCDs, specifically diabetes, or how many people is affected by these are topics that policymakers are um, generally attracted by, especially when they're campaigning. So, in my personal experience, this is a very useful tool, also a smart objective. Uh, thank you. Um, of course, this could not be uh, complemented um, uh, without saying a few words about industry. Bruno, you have said in your in your observation before uh, the need to be careful with the industry because there are some industries that are seen as uh, not uh, so good for people with diabetes. But then there are other parts of industry that we can uh, work with. So Nupur, can we can you a little bit, a little bit more on that? Which strategies could we use to to transform industry into partners? Uh, uh, what are the dangers? What what are the what benefits? What can we really do to work with industry in? Because we at the end of the day we need to improve life of those who live with diabetes. We need to to fight stigma. We need to fight discrimination of children in school. So what? what can be done with industry to get to reach this goal yes uh, thank you so i i really do believe that uh, there is no point in being combative with uh, our stakeholders because we we are all um, you know um, as diabetes advocates we we do feel strongly for um, you know having um, there there should be healthy lifestyle and healthy food available in schools and and of course we know that with the high sugar content and the high fat content in a lot of the uh, packaged foods which are available today it's um, it's really not um, ideal for growing children um, so I think a good thing to to possibly do is to engage in dialogue with um, these uh, you know companies and um, you know uh, these organizations to talk to them to create some awareness. Um, you know, in in schools, and and you really don't need. Um, I also noticed a question in the in the chat box. 
uh, you know, is there any funding? But the thing is, um, you can get a lot done with with the passion that you have for for diabetes and you know to fight the stigma. Um, so what we do uh, in India is that we visit a lot of schools, and that takes no funding at all. You all you need is a bunch of passionate volunteers advocates you go to the school you talk to the kids about a healthy lifestyle you ask them how many of you play video games and how many of you actually go out and play football and you know you'll be surprised with the answers i mean uh, so many children are getting diagnosed with type 2 diabetes um so many kids from our community as well so i think it's uh, you know rather than being combative it's it's better to um you know talk and have conversations and i think that's the way forward yeah, and, and uh, in these uh, school visits, you can use the kids' resources because it's easy to get to, uh, to get a download from the website, and it's it's really simple to use. They are excellent in uh, in having clear message, and it's very it's a really really good material. And part of the materials are translated into eighteen lang different languages and are adopted to national original uh, uh, settings, which is really great. Um, so it's uh, again, it's something that we need to engage. And we have, uh, Nupur, you approached or you have talked about the food industry, for instance. But what about the, the pharma and medical device industry? What can we do? Because they, they might have their own agendas, which is, of course, uh, understandable. And we have our own agendas. How can we work together in order to get to meet the agendas and to reach the goal of improving the lives of those living with diabetes? Yes, thank you. So um, I think that, um, like you said, you know, the reality is that that pharma and, and industry have their own objectives, but but that's not really uh, that's not a surprise. We we do know that. So um, I think that what would really help is that, you know, if we could be really transparent, I mean, as not just as advocates, but every stakeholder out there, if they're really, if they're absolutely transparent about, you know, what they do and 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 what they've got in the ring, um, I think that really answers a lot of questions because sometimes there are questions around, you know, there are questions around funding or there are questions around sponsorship or lots of things. But I think, um, again, you know, well, if you engage in, in dialogue and if you um, have a conversation, um, I think these are just small roadblocks and uh, it, it is important to, to engage with them because we cannot uh, pretend like they don't exist because they do. Yeah. Bruno, you want to say something? Your, your face was showing that we want to say something, <laughs> not really. I, I, I second everything that Mukur just said. Uh, we cannot think as the industry, actually it's a potential stakeholder, as, as Mukur just said. And uh, it, is, it is very hard for, for us, a health advocates, sometimes to think them as, as allies. But actually, uh, when it comes to opportunities of funding and getting stuff done, we need funding. So. Uh, the industry can be a potential stakeholder when it comes to funding. A lot of the projects that uh, we carry out are actually funded by the industry. So um, this this needs to be considered as a as a, yeah. as a as a as a management tool for the for the main goal. You know, do not lose sight of the main goal. That's my advice. Yeah, indeed, because we are all we are all in the same boat. We are all part of the same ecosystem and need to work together in the best possible way again to improve life for those living with diabetes. So to finish up this part of Q&A, uh, I would like to launch a, a challenge to the three of you. Uh, if you would like to, if you want to describe the kids uh, project or the kids resources in a few sentences, a few words, a, a sentence, what what will you do? What do you say? I mean. Uh, we want to go first. I, I think I'll go first. If, uh, so I forgot to mention this earlier, but to everyone who's watching, I would really urge you to, um, to you know, to go to the website, to go to uh, the IDF website and uh, to check out the resources there. I think um, there was also a question about how do I begin advocacy and where do I start and how do I take the first step? And you'll get, you'll get really a lot of information there. Um, I think that, that is the first step. Uh, so I think it's a it's a it's a treasure trove there. Indeed, thank you, Bruno, and then Sarah. Well, I think uh, the idea of uh, kids project is an excellent an excellent uh, awareness uh, tool. 
uh, in my personal experience, it has been very helpful uh, dealing with, uh, especially with policymakers. So my advice is to, to download it and use it because uh, it has a lot of research within. So th that's my, my final thought. Thank you, and Sarah? Um, in my own uh, opinion and experience, um, I would advise any, any young advocate, aspiring advocate, to consider um, reading through the kids' um, toolkit. It's, uh, I love how detailed it is in each and every step you can take. So, you know, sometimes you want to advocate, but you don't know where to start, which step you should follow. Um, you, you need a path. And with the with a toolkit, it guides you step by step uh, in ways you can actually make um, your vision a reality. So it's a great it's a great way to start as an advocate, and I urge uh, anyone that wants to start out in terms of advocacy to use it. Um, uh, do your research in your own country, identify the problems you have, and just follow the really easy steps. And, and then you will you will you will see um, a huge difference in your journey. So yeah, I highly recommend it. Many thanks. Uh, so uh, we like we need to to finish up this Q and A part because we are over two minutes now over time. So I would like to thank all speakers for their time and excellent contributions. Um, without you, nothing would be possible. And many thanks for that. Uh, I would like to also to to thank all participants. I hope that you have, that you have enjoyed and felt that this webinar was useful in, and interesting. And a word of thanks also for the advocacy team at IDF for not only organizing this webinar and for all the work that we do. Uh, many thanks for that, Bruno Bay and our interns, of course. Uh, the advocacy toolkit that we mentioned before is freely uh, available for download. You can you can have here the, the link for it. It's a very interesting piece of information. It's very useful. And you can also download not only the toolkit, but also the other resources. They are there for you. Use it as much as you like. So, and I would like to thank also Sanofi for the support. The kids project is only possible due to, due to Sanofi support, of course. For those that would like to revisit the webinar, you'll be receiving a link for the recording of the webinar. And also, uh, we would like to ask you to respond to a sh very short questionnaire because your opinion is relevant to us, is relevant to us to improve uh, the way that we are organizing webinars for the next time to be even better. If you have any questions, comments, uh, you can send your questions and comments to the, to the way, uh, email address kids at idf.org. This is the closing uh, part of it. Uh, it's my pleasure to close the session. Um, have a nice day. I hope to see you soon in person, preferably uh, ne maybe next year in Lisbon for the IDF Congress in December 2022. Take care, of course, and uh, enjoy life. Many thanks for attending. Bye.